morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to Left Side of the Aisle. I'm Larry Erickson. I'm your host. And for the next nearly half hour, I'm going to be rambling away about things that I think are actually important enough for you to take note of and maybe want to do something about. Uh, comments and reactions to the show can be sent to me directly. My personal email is hoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. Uh, if you didn't catch that, go to my website. It's called Lotus Surviving a Dark Time. And you can get the email address from there. Or if you prefer, you can leave a comment there if you like. Uh, just do be aware that if you do send me email, two requests. One includes something in the subject line to make it clear this is not spam, of which, like the rest of us, I get way too much. Um, and be a little patient about getting an answer because I'm actually kind of slow about answering email. But you will get an answer. All right, with that, let's get on with it. I'm going to start with something I've been meaning to do the last couple of weeks, and this time I figured I'll do it right at the beginning of the show so I don't forget, and I intend to do it the next couple of weeks, too. Uh, in the elections in November, uh, I noticed for the totals here in Carver, uh, where, this is, where this is done, that there were three offices on the ballot where there was a candidate for the Green Rainbow Party on, on, on the ballot for that office. And in each case, those candidates got, here in Carver, about 150 votes. Which means there are about 150 of us out here in Carver. If any of you out there in Carver are interested in getting together, getting to know each other a little bit, maybe even trying to make a little noise about some progressive issues, uh, please, hoviating at AOL.com, contact me and we'll see if we can get something going. Again, I'm going to mention that in the next couple of shows, too. All right, we're going to start. I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to have any good news this week because it's been a lousy week. It really has been a lousy week, and I haven't really seen any good news to talk about. Um, for example, this week we had the release of the report on the CIA's use of torture in the wake of the 9-11 attacks, a release which had to be done over the objections of President Hopi Changi and his most transparent administration ever. Now, the release is a good thing, but even though it really just reminds us of the facts that we as a nation can be really as every bit as scummy as anybody else and every bit as willing to drop at the first provocation to a level of depravity we ascribe to our enemies. And to remind us that for all of the torture, all the criminality, the only person who's actually suffered any legal consequences for this was a former CIA agent named John Kiriakou, who was sent to prison for being the one to first tell us about the torture. In addition to this, this week we have our Nobel Peace Prize president swearing up and down that he's not going to expand his lovely little war uh, in Syria and Iraq, and that he's, there's going to be no boots on the ground but at the same time, demanding Congress not pass any legislation that might say he can't do either of those. And at the same time, he's saying he don't need no stinking new resolution to do whatever he wants to do anyway, because, I mean, he's the commander in chief, don't you know? All the while describing his role and his authority in terms that could have fit comfortably on the lips of George Bush or of the big Dick Cheney. Meanwhile, on the home front, we have a unanimous Supreme Court declaring that if your employer keeps you after your shift is over for a mandatory security check that is treating every employee, including you, as a suspected thief, they don't have to pay you for that time that you're stuck there because, after all, you're not actually working. Writing for the court, Justice Clarence's Uncle Thomas said that the screening process is not a principal activity of the workers' jobs, one with which the employees cannot dispense if he is to perform his principal activities, quote-unquote. Now, the fact that you can't keep your job if you dispense with this uh, humiliating check, which certainly would seem to interfere with your ability to perform your principal activities, that, that just didn't matter. So before I get to the main part of the show and what I really want to spend time talking about, I'm going to try to cheer myself up a bit. I have not one, not two, but three hero awards. These are awards that we give out uh, on occasion, just when somebody just does the right thing on a matter big or small. 
Our first hero is Matt Tribe of Ogden, Utah. Now this past fall, Olive Garden ran this promotion where for $100 you could get this never-ending pasta pass with which you could eat as much pasta as you wanted over the next seven weeks. Well, he got a pass and then figured that, in fact, he probably could not possibly eat all that pasta. So instead, he embarked on what he called random acts of pasta. He went to various Olive Gardens. He went several times a day, got a takeout order of pasta, and quoting him, I just go show up at someone's house and brighten their life with some Olive Garden. By the end of the seven weeks, Tribe had used the pass for himself 14 times and was still able to feed 125 people, including a number who were homeless. Now, of course, no good deed goes unsuspected in our cynical age where it's considered the height of hipness to sneer at anything that smacks of unselfishness. So there are people claiming this is actually a great big uh, marketing stunt by Olive Garden. And of course, like all good conspiracy notions, this one requires the perpetrator of the hoax, in this case Olive Garden, to be both amazingly clever and rock brain stupid in just the correct amounts and in just the correct ways in order for the conspiracy to hold together and show up the obvious proof of deviousness. Now, Olive Garden denied any involvement in this, uh, except, of course, for providing the pasta, uh, which to the conspiracy theorists only proves that it really is a stunt. For his point, uh, uh, for his part, Matt Tribe responded to all the vi vituperation by tweeting, quoting him, I genuinely wanted to do something nice for people and now everyone hates me. Half of the people call me a thief, half of the people say it's a PR from Olive Garden. I'm having a real whole t hard time with it all. Well, I gotta tell you, not everyone thinks that guy. I think you're a hero. And you know what? Even if it does turn out to be a marketing ploy, I don't care. It still meant that a bunch of hungry, hungry folks, including uh, some homeless folks, got a hot meal. All right, uh, our second Hero Award. Now, this is not new. This is a while back, uh, last fall, in fact, but I just heard about it, and I certainly think it's worth noting. Our heroes here are two employees at a now-closed assistant living facility in Castro Valley, California. They are Maurice Rowland, the cook, and Miguel Alvarez, the janitor. In October 2013, the Community Care Licensing Division of California's Department of Social Services ordered the facility shut down as the result of a laundry list of violations, including hand handling injuries improperly and neglecting to hand out appropriate medications. The residents were supposed to be uh, relocated, but the department screwed up. And even though most of the staff had already left, 16 residents, some of them confined to their beds, got left behind to fend for themselves. That's when Roland and Alvarez stepped up. They got together and decided they could not leave the residents alone. Despite their limited training, they bathed and fed the residents and doled out their medications. They worked around the clock for days without getting paid, mind you. They worked around the clock for days, only taking quick breaks to take a shower. When a resident's condition uh, deteriorated, the pair called 911. And after that happened for the fourth time, authorities finally got the message that, hey, something's wrong here. And the fire department and the sheriff's office stepped in to, uh, to deal with it. All the residents have been safely relocated and the incident actually led the California State Legislature to pass laws to hopefully prevent this sort of thing from ever happening again. Which leaves only one question for me. Where are the medals for Maurice Rowland and Miguel Alvarez, who clearly are heroes? All right, finally, one more. One more hero award. Uh, people have been protesting in New York City to express their outrage over the recent grand jury decisions in the killings of Michael Brown and Eric Gardner. A number of celebrities have also expressed their opinions on the matter, but one celebrity couple uh, has apparently decided to put their money where their tweets are. On Sunday, December 7th, musician John Legend and his wife, model Chrissy Teigen, hired a whole bunch of food trucks to come and pass out free meals to, to both demonstrators and to the homeless. There are a variety of trucks providing a variety of food, and each of them gave out hundreds of free meals. 
Now, the trucks are organized. The actual physical organization was done by Operation Help or Hush, a movement that grew out of Twitter exchanges into actual on-the-streets action. And, by the way, uh, even though they were publicly thanked for this on Twitter, of course, uh, the couple has not actually directly acknowledged that they were the source of the money for this. Well, taking the action without seeking the credit, I expect is hard for most of us, for most of our egos, and I expect it's even harder for celebrities whose lives really revolve around publicity. Which is another reason for me to say here that John Legend and Christy Teigen are heroes. And I did that one last because it leads directly into what I want to spend the rest of my time talking about. Last week, I said there was much more to talk about with regard to the Michael Brown killing and the, uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, and the grand jury, jury decision about that. Little did I know that that discussion would have to be largely put aside to address an even more egregious case, the unpunished killing of Eric Garner. Back on July 17th, Eric Garner was in Tompkinsville, which is a town in Staten Island in New York City. He was accused by cops of selling untaxed cigarettes, of which he apparently did have a history. He protested that he had done nothing wrong, an account that was actually supported at the time by eyewitnesses on the scene. But the cops demanded he put his arms behind his back to be handcuffed, and when he objected, New York Police Department cop Daniel Pantaleo grabbed him from behind, wrapped his arm around Garner's neck, and wrestled him to the ground using a chokehold and pressing his face into the pavement. The other cops swarmed over Garner, climbing on him, pinning him down to the pavement face down. Garner, in a chokehold, with other cops piled on top of him, several times protested that he couldn't breathe. And then he went limp, and later he died. On December 3rd, a Staten Island grand jury refused to indict white cop Daniel Pantaleo in the death of unarmed black man Eric Garner. This decision came despite the fact that there is video showing everything I just described. Despite the fact that the video clearly shows Pantaleo grabbing Garner from behind. Despite the fact that the video sh shows cops swarming over Garner, despite the clear proof that Pantaleo was using a chokehold which had been banned by the NYPD for 11 years precisely because of the risk of killing someone that it involves, despite the clear view of Pantaleo pushing Garner's face into the pavement, despite the undeniable fact that Garner repeatedly protested, I can't breathe. Despite that, no indictment, no charge. Not murder, not manslaughter, not even voluntary manslaughter, not even something with regard to negligence. No charge. Despite the clear record that even the cops could not deny, no indictment, no charge. Despite the fact that the New York medical examiner called this a homicide and said it was the chokehold that killed Eric Garner, no indictment, no charge. You want to know how bad this was? You want to know how shocking this was? Even Bill O'Reilly was troubled by it. Even posters at leading right-wing websites like HotAir.com and RedState.com called it things like baffling and infuriating. A writer for the National Review slammed it. Even Charles freaking Krauthammer called it totally incomprehensible. But there was no indictment, no charge. And again, an unarmed black man is dead. And again, a white cop walks scot-free. What in hell does it take? What does it take to get a cop indicted? How much evidence is needed? How much proof is required when a video and a medical examiner's report are not enough? What would be enough? And that brings up something we're going to be talking about right after the break. And we're back. And I just said, I just, you know, I was, I was just 
saying, what does it take to get a cop indicted? And that's, that's actually the other part of this whole thing. I talked last week, and again just now, about white cops killing unarmed black men and getting away with it. But it's more than that. It's cops, in general, getting away with murder. I talked last week about the fact that a prosecutor who brings a case to a grand jury and really wants to get an indictment can get one. Despite their supposed independence, grand juries are actually creatures of the prosecution. The only evidence they see is what the prosecution presents. Their understanding of the law is based on what the prosecution tells them. So why are cops the one exception to the rule? Why, when, as the saying goes, a prosecutor could get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich if they wanted to, why do cops over and over and over again walk away free, untouched, uncharged, unindicted? And yes, it is over and over and over again. A recent study by the Houston Chronicle of grand juries in Harris County, Texas, that being the county where Houston is, that study revealed that Houston cops involved in shootings have been cleared by those Harris County grand juries 288 consecutive times dating back to 2004. Between 2008 and 2012, Houston cops shot 121 people, 52 of them are dead. More than a quarter of those people, including 10 of the unarmed, uh, 10 of those who died, were unarmed. Officers shot unarmed civilians who reached for or grabbed for their waistline or who held objects such as cell phones or a hairbrush, which cops claimed they thought were weapons. The paper study also noted that in Dallas, 81 shootings involving 175 officers over the period 2008 to 2012 resulted in exactly one cop being indicted. No cop in Chicago has been charged with an on-duty killing since 2007. U.S. cops kill, according to various sources, U.S. cops kill about 1,000 people a year. According to a study by Bowling Green State University, those 1,000 shootings produce an average of four indictments a year. That means that 99.6% of the time a cop kills someone, there isn't even a trial. I mean, let's even say, it was of those thousand cases, let's say that 90% of them are clearly justified, clearly with self-defense, clearly your life was threatened, no question about those, okay? 90% of them, no question. That would still mean that in 96% of the cases where there was a question, nothing happened. Not even a trial. In fact, even for small crap, cops virtually never get indicted. That's assuming the case even gets to a grand jury. It wasn't just dismissed out of hand by some prosecutor or someone. As a practical matter, cops are almost completely immune from legal consequences for their actions. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. For one thing, it's because grand juries do not want to indict cops. Most people, Lord knows why, most people just trust cops more than their accusers. Trust the cop more than the victim. No matter, and the evidence doesn't matter. Although actually, Lord does know why. We are actually socially conditioned to trust authority and defer to authority. Now, you don't believe me? You think you're different? You think that has nothing, no, no way to affect you? All right, I would give you two statements. Just thought experiment here, okay? One is a statement by an arresting cop who says he, and we're going to assume it's a he for here, uh, he was committing a crime and, was, and resisted arrest, so I had to use increased force. The other was by the accused, who said, I was just standing there minding my own business, and his cop comes and starts hassling me. When I told him to leave me alone, he attacks me. All right, who, do you, who are you going to believe? Who do you think is more trustworthy? Now, if you said, if you said, based on that, as most people would say, you just trust the cop more, Congratulations, you just exonerated Daniel Pantelio in the killing of Eric Garner. Because you assumed 
that the cop, the official, the authority, the cop must be more trustworthy than anybody else. But another reason, actually a bigger reason, is that prosecutors do not want to indict cops. They don't actually want indictments. They depend on cops for investigations to get them the evidence that they need to pursue criminals. They work with cops on a regular basis. They associate with them. They, they're, they're on the same team. Which means that prosecutors have both a professional need for and a personal bias in favor of cops. And there's one more reason. A legal, or if you prefer, legalistic one. The legal standard for justifying deadly force by a cop was set by the Supreme Court in the 1980s. It's objective reasonableness. A cop who kills someone isn't liable for that killing if the killing was objectively reasonable. All right, what's wrong with that? Well, uh, civil rights attorney Chase Mader uh, said this recently, wrote this recently, quoting him, in actual courtroom practice, objective reasonableness has, come nearly, has become nearly impossible to tell apart from the subjective snap judgments of panic-fueled police officers. American courts universally defer to the law enforcement officer's own personal assessment of the threat at the time. No second guessing is allowed, no, no hindsight is permitted, no uh, different analysis is allowed. If a cop claims they felt threatened, that's good enough. Even if they are demonstrably wrong, there was a 2000 case where two cops uh, shot up uh, the, a, a car and killed the occupants because they claimed the car was being driven at them. Turns out forensics proved that the car was stationary. Didn't matter. No charge. This same thing applies to, uh, to uh, Darren Wilson, by the way. Uh, Wilson's testimony before the grand jury about what happened cannot be correct. Just cannot be. This is beyond the ways w in which he changed his story. I, I mentioned that he changed his story two ways, at least two ways, between his initial statements to the police and to the grand jury. Talking to the police, he said he didn't realize that Michael Brown fit the description of someone accused of having robbed a convenience store a little while earlier. Um, he, but he testified to the grand jury that, oh, he did realize that, did know that, that's why he turned around and went back and confronted him. He also told police that Brown pushed something, that was his word, something, into the hands of, um, of uh, uh, the man who was with him. His name was uh, Johnson. His name was Dorian Johnson, it was. Uh, he pushed something into Dorian, Dorian Johnson's hand. When he got to the grand jury, he said specifically it was a handful of cigars. But this is not about that. This has to do with an audio recording that by coincidence was made that caught the sounds of Wilson's gunfire. It was caught in the background of a video chat done by uh, somebody who did not even realize the significance of the sounds until later. The sound clip was analyzed by the people who developed the software called Spot Shooter, which is used by 65 cities, including Ferguson, uh, to pinpoint shootings. This, uh, by the way, though, the ones in Ferguson were too far away to be of any use here, but Ferguson does use them. Their analysis indicated that there were 10 shots fired from a single spot by a single shooter over a period of just over six and a half seconds. Now, in his description of the event to police, Wilson claimed that Brown charged at him from 30 feet away, and when he got within 15 feet, 15 feet is what he said, that's when he fired his first shots. But, but Brown kept coming, didn't even slow down, so Wilson fired again and killed him. Okay, the shots covered just over six and a half seconds. Wilson claims Brown was charging at him. But at a normal walking speed of about three miles an hour, in six and a half seconds, Brown would have covered nearly 29 feet, nearly double the distance Wilson claimed. Wilson's testimony cannot be correct, period. But it doesn't matter. Because if Wilson, in an adrenaline-fueled panic, thought it was 15 feet, that's good enough. 
We are not only socialized to believe the cop, not only do prosecutors not want to charge cops, we are almost legally required to believe the cop, and we can't even say unless the evidence says otherwise, because even when we have video and a medical examiner's report, that's not enough to overcome that triple bias. Frank Serpico, remember him? Frank Serpico said recently in an op-ed in the New York Daily News, in the old days they used to put a gun or a knife on somebody after a shooting, now they don't even bother. They just testify, I was in fear of my life. The grand jury spy it, the DA winks and nods, and that's the end. It's time to stop talking about a broken system or how we have to repair this broken system. It's time to recognize that this is the system. These cases are not aberrations of the system. This is how the system is supposed to work. People like Darren Wilson and Daniel Pentelio and the rest of them are supposed to get off. Because they are simultaneously, cops are simultaneously tools of, protectors of, enablers of, and part of authority, of power in a society that increasingly sees fewer and fewer people having more and more and controlling more and more, while more and more people have and control less and less. A society that still, despite all our claims, is one in which black lives matter less than white lives. We don't need reform. We don't need palliatives and soporifics like body cameras. I mean, again, ask Eric Garner how much good video does. Oh, wait, we can't. We need an entire fundamental, dare I say, radical change in how we view cops and the role of cops, more a radical change in how we view authority about the distrib distribution of wealth and power in our society. Now, it needs to be said at this point that most cops are decent people, trying to do the best they can for themselves, their families, and their communities. But we cannot trust ourselves, our families, our communities, especially communities of color. We cannot trust our liberties and our very lives to the mere hope that those cops will not be corrupted by the cop culture in which they are immersed. A culture that sees the world as us versus them, as insiders versus outsiders, when we are the outsiders in our own communities. A culture that increasingly sees itself not as a community resource, but as an occupying force, and as a culture that breeds an ing ingrown fear, a constant fear of being at risk of your life, even though measured by the actual rate of deaths, uh, the actual rate of death on the job, cops in this country don't make the top 10 of the worst. That cop culture is recently why a post at the, at the website Daily Coast wrote that there are no good cops anymore. Good cops, he, mean, he, he meant, were defined as those who do the right thing, even if it's hard, even if it means going up against other cops. Cops, he said, who do the right thing and have some skin in the game. Cops, as I say, who have not been morally corrupted, who have not had their ethical compasses permanently demagnetized by the polluted waters in which they swim on a daily basis. Now, today, now we just have to wait and see what the excuse will be for the cop who murdered 12-year-old Tamir Rice in Cleveland. That's it. We're out of here. Have the best week you can.